I noticed that the, the five minute crowd was, was more like a 15 minute crowd this morning, so you have a little extra time to get up and get ready this morning. But so glad to have you here. Uh, just a few announcements as we begin uh, worship today. You can check those out in your, in your bulletin. Uh, but during today's service, we're going to recognize our, our veterans uh, in just a few minutes. So uh, our veterans, uh, be ready to stand up. We're going to honor you. Uh, and speaking of our, our veterans, on uh, uh, this month, the month of November, we're going to be, that's all about, uh, it's all going to be about our veterans and collecting for uh, the, the state veterans home in Salisbury area. Uh, so you can see a note about that in your, in your book. Uh, our Young at Heart uh, senior group, you guys are going to meet this Tuesday, and there's going to be a youth lock-in on Friday. I think that's about all of the, the top announcements together, so I'll let you read in your, your bulletin. Did I miss anything? Yes? I wasn't listening really good. <laughs> you, you weren't listening really good?
children for the children's time. And if you haven't already, we have baskets down here on the altar. Certainly keep those folks uh, in your prayers. 
Are there other prayer concerns or praises to lift up before our, our church family today? I would ask you to continue to lift up my grandfather in your prayers. He's, he's still in ICU at the, uh, the VA hospital. <laughs> doing, doing better, but uh, certainly still needs our prayers. Mom had a, a praise this morning, had a great report uh, from her, some of her scans this week, so I'll lift that up uh, as a praise. Susan? Oh, yeah. Sweet 16, Jake. Yes. All right, happy birthday. Awesome. <laughs> Elizabeth. Um, Nancy Jean's story, you can see from yeah, here. Yeah, Nancy Jean's story in your Yes. Jason had several surgery. All right, Jason's having some surgery on Wednesday. Greg Dayball. Greg Dayball. So good to have Bruce back with us this morning. Bruce has had some pretty major surgery and has been in rehab. But, uh, Bruce, so good to have you back this morning. Awesome to see you here. Yes. Uh, the little girl I had to do in prayers last week. She yes. had an open heart surgery. Okay. So that would be the part I want to take. Yes. Praise for her. Any others this morning? Let's bow before the Lord in prayer. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you today in the name of Jesus, in the name that's above all names. Lord, we are, we are so grateful. We are so thankful. Lord, you are so great and you are so good. You're a good, good father. Lord, you, you know what's best for us and you, you want what's best for us. So, Lord, I just thank you for, for who you are, not just for what you do for us, but for simply who you are. God, you're able to do so much more than we can ever ask, but we come bringing our prayers, our petitions, Lord, standing in the gap for those that we love and care for that just need a healing touch from you. God, we know that you're always there, you're present healing, that you are moving. So Lord, we give you thanks. We acknowledge you. We worship you today. We invite you to look inside of our hearts and minds and Lord, we ask for your forgiveness. We are sinful people. We have all sinned and fallen short. And so we ask for your forgiveness. We're thankful for your grace and mercy. Lord, mold us into your disciples. Mold us into your people. Help, you, help us to seek you first in all things. As always, Lord, we pray for our church that you would continue to bind us together and strengthen us, Lord, Lord, that we might be about your work and building your kingdom. Lord, help us to be sensitive to, to your leadership, not ours, but, but yours, always seeking your guidance and direction of your Holy Spirit. We pray for our country and for our leaders, Lord, that you would heal our land, Lord, for all those that put themselves in harm's way for our protection, especially, Lord, we pray for our troops and for our veterans, Lord, we watch over them. Lord, for the message you've given me this week, Lord, I pray that it would be effective and accomplish your purpose this day. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Kelly, that was a two-minute prayer today. I, I just cruised. Kelly was going to have a prayer this morning, and I was, I was on cruise control. We just, we just prayed. Um, it's okay. Pray next week. Derek, you're running the sound. Turn me down just a, just a hair. I feel like I'm echoing a little bit. There's a lot of changes in this building over the last two weeks. If you look down, you say, oh, we've got a brand new floor. It looks awesome. So thank you for contributing to that. Uh, we have one more week to make a, a gift to that. Uh, thank you, Dale Piker is here, uh, who's making a, a up to $10,000 matching gift. So your money is like double if you give to the building fund uh, to pay off this, this project. And we have a new sound system. Uh, we haven't really been able to get in here and get it all tweaked yet because of the, the foreign project, but um, anyway, a lot, of, a lot of good things happening in this building, so thank you for your support for that. But moving on to, to summer, um, flee, baby, flee. Flee, baby, flee. flee. And I, I just want to go this morning and send out an email to the, the kids ministry. This, this summer may be rated, rated PG-13, okay? Uh, so just fair warning, uh, it's good for our teenagers, good for our young adults, but if you're, 
the young kids, they won't get a church. Uh, flee, baby, flee. Let's pray as we begin. Father, I pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts and minds together will be found acceptable in your sight. The Lord our God and our Redeemer. Amen. So we've been talking about guardrails. And we all know what guardrails are. We don't really pay attention to guardrails until you need one, right? Uh, maybe you've noticed some more guardrails here in the last few weeks, but a guardrail in essence is a system designed, a system designed to keep vehicles from straying into dangerous or off-limit areas. So a system designed to keep vehicles from straying into dangerous or off-limit areas. The thing about guardrails are they're not actually located in the most dangerous area. They're located in the real estate kind of just inside of the most dangerous area. They're to keep us from going into the most dangerous area, whatever that might be, the cliff, uh, oncoming traffic, the bridge, whatever it may be. So they're, they're placed just inside of the danger zone. And so we've been asking the question, what would it look like for us to have guardrails in our life? What would it look like for us to place some boundaries in our, in our life? This, this warning system that when we bump up against it, something triggers it like, oh, we need to get back on the road. We need to get back on the, the right track. And so we've kind of changed the definition of guardrails. We have a new definition. Guardrails, a standard of behavior that becomes a matter of conscience. A standard of behavior that becomes a matter of conscience. Because let's face it, some of the, the greatest regrets in our life, some of the greatest regrets that you may have in your life can be avoided, could be avoided, if you would establish proper guardrails, proper boundaries. In the world, the world says, well, that's, that's what you're all about. Why are you Christians? That, that's all you're about. You know, your rules and your thou shalt nots and all that stuff in the Bible. But guess what? The rules are for our good. They're all for our good. Ultimate freedom happens within the boundaries that God has set forth in his word. So a standard of behavior that becomes a matter of conscience. Every desire Every danger zone in life requires some guardrails. Now today, I'm gonna to talk about what I think is the most needed area of all as far as guardrails. This is the most needed area that we need guardrails, and yet I think it's probably the most restricted uh, or resisted area. But I think if we get this, this one area right, I believe, the effects of that are, are enormous. If we get this one area right, it will impact our community, it will impact our nation, it will impact our, our world. It will transform our culture. There will be less poverty. There will be less children in foster care. Fewer men in prison. Less domestic violence. If you get this one area right, but at the same time, every time I, I preach on this one area, I feel like one of those Old Testament prophets, you know, crying in the wilderness. No matter how I illustrate it, no matter how much emphasis I put on it, I usually feel like I'm being ignored. Yeah, that's, that's what I would expect the preacher to say when you go right back to doing things and living life the way you always did. So if every danger zone requires guardrails, and we're talking about strong steel guardrails in life, not the plastic guardrails that our culture puts out, but strong steel guardrails. If every, if every area of danger and desire requires guardrails, physical and sexual intimacy, they require reinforced titanium, okay? Reinforced titanium. Why is that? Well, here's the reason. Unlike any other area in your life, if you make a mistake, if you make some kind of disaster in any other area of life, I feel like you can probably recover, fully recover from it. Think about it. You can fully recover from a financial disaster. You know, you could go broke, uh, go bankrupt, whatever, but you can build yourself back up and get a new job. You know, you can, you can recover 
from that. You can learn from it, and eventually you can laugh about it. You can recover from that. You can recover from an educational disaster. You can flunk out of school, but then you can go back and work extra hard and go to school at night and in the summertime and recover from that. And that's just one of those funny stories you tell your kids one day. You can recover from a professional disaster you know, where you maybe you get fired or you have to change careers or something. You can recover from that and be okay. But when it comes to the area of sexuality, when you cross certain lines when it comes to that, those are the things you never really fully recover from. No one ever laughs about those things. We know this. We know this. It's no wonder that Paul pens these words. Paul says, flee. Flee from sexual immorality. I'm going to put the slide up. We go. There we go. 1 Corinthians 6, 18. Flee from sexual immorality. He doesn't say be careful. He doesn't say get as close to the line as you possibly can. What does he say? He says, flee. That's why the title of my sermon is Flee, Baby, Flee. When it comes to sexual immorality, I mean, what could be more clear than this? Flee in the other direction. And here's the thing if you're married, this is what you want your spouse to do to flee from sexual immorality. If you have children, this is what you want your children to do. If you have grandchildren, this is what you want them to do. To do. This is what you want everyone that you know and love to do, but you're not sure that you want to do this, right? I mean, maybe you're here, you're like, I'm, I'm glad, my, glad my teenagers are here, glad my college students are here, glad my husband's here, glad my wife's here to hear this today. But when it comes to you, some of you don't flee, what do you do? You flirt. Instead of fleeing, you flirt. I said this last week, and we're going to talk about it a little bit, but our culture, there are so many things that our culture will bait us right to the edge of that cliff. I mean, they bait us right to the edge, but then when you step over certain lines, our culture is going to chastise you. Our culture is just going to, going to hammer you for it. Because we all agree that there, there are certain lines that you just don't cross. You don't cross. I mean, we can all agree, even our culture says, I mean, there's a certain age that girls should not get pregnant. You know, we're, as a goal, we're against teenage pregnancy. Everybody's against that. But have you paid attention to how we market to the teenage girls? Have you paid attention to how, what's in the mall? I mean, everybody agrees that, you know, that there needs to be a, a guardrail here. Uh, and everybody agrees this, and our culture is finally talking about it, thank goodness. But everybody agrees that there needs to be some kind of guardrail around things that happen on the internet, right? That there's some line out there when it goes comes to the internet and porn and all that stuff. There's some line where we say, you know, that that's too far. No, you know, that's 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 gross. Don't don't do that. There's some line where we where the culture says that that's too far. Church, we need something stronger than that. We need guardrails before we get to that area. And knowing that our culture, everywhere we look, we're, we're being baited in that direction. Every time we turn on the TV, every time you turn a page of a magazine, every time you walk through the mall, we're being baited in that direction. And then when some guy finally takes the bait and gets all addicted, we're like, gosh, that's, that's disgusting. But no, you know what? They just took the bait. Think about this for a second. The way God intended intimacy to work is that intimacy happens within the safety of marriage. You need the safety of marriage for intimacy. Faithfulness in marriage, celibacy in singleness. This is how God designed it in His Word, and that's not buzzkill it in His life giving. The vulnerability of sex requires the safety of marriage. Marriage, that's what we're for. That's what we, that's what we lift up. But you know what? When's the last time you saw a love scene between two married people in the movie? And why are you laughing at that? When's the last time you saw a movie where there was a love scene between two married people? We need hard rails because 
loves our culture, they're, they're not going to provide it. We need something stronger. We need something, a warning system that says, you know, I'm going to go, I'm not even going to get close to that guardrail. I'm going to, something's going to go off like 10 feet from that guardrail that causes me to go in the other direction. There's great incentives for guardrails around our marriages, our relationships, around sexual immorality. There are greater, even greater incentives for us as, as Christians. Let's look at what Paul says. He continues, flee from sexual immorality. Do you not know? Which means that they did not know, and some of you do not know. Do you not know that your bodies are temples? Did you know that? That, that our bodies are temples. That's how we should treat our bodies. Maybe you got up this morning, looked in the mirror, and said, Hey, I got, I got a good looking temple. Or, or maybe like me, my temple's growing. <laughs> God says your body is a temple. That means that our bodies are holy. Are holy. Look what he says, continue on. Your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you. Now, if you're a Christian, and even if you're not a Christian, I want you to know here that your bodies are sacred. All of our bodies are, are sacred. God says you are sacred. All people are sacred. Our bodies are sacred. But when you become a Christian, God's Spirit comes and lives inside of you, which means that our bodies become temples. 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 Your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God. It says that the Holy Spirit lives in you, that your body is very, very special. And listen to the implication. Verse 19, you are not your own. You don't belong to you. Do you know that? You don't belong to you. Your body doesn't belong to you because God has moved in. You were bought at a price, verse 20. You were bought at, the, at a price. And that's the gospel that, that Jesus Christ came to this earth and he died for your sins. He purchased you by his blood that was shed on the cross. He purchased you from sin. You are no longer a slave to sin. You don't have to do what your desires say. And how freeing is that to say, you know what? We can have desires that we don't give in to. We can have desires that we say no to. It's about our desires yielding to God's design, which is faithfulness in marriage and celibacy and singleness. You've been purchased from the power of sin. You were bought at a price. Therefore, this is the implication, therefore honor God with your bodies. Honor God with your body. If it is dishonoring to God, do not do it with your body. If it is dishonoring to God, don't take your body there. If it's dishonoring to God, don't look at it. If it's dishonoring to God, don't think about it. You can live every day as if knowing that, you know what, my body is a temple of God. And I want to do everything I can in my life and that my body honors God. So God says when it comes to the area of sexual immorality, he says you must flee, 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 flee. Not flirt, 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 flirt. You gotta flee sexual immorality, which means practically speaking, you gotta establish some guardrails. We need some boundaries. And so for the next few moments, I'm gonna give you some really specific advice as it comes to guardrails. And these guardrails, church, I promise you, I promise you, you will not regret. And you may be asking, Pastor Bill, where did you come up with these? Well, I made them up. I did. I made them up. I mean, it is based on scripture, but, but I, I made them up. But I made them up not based on a conversation, but I made them up based on many Many, many tearful conversations that I've had with folks over the years, uh, over 17 years of full time ministry, where I've helped people, pastoral care wise, grow through some very, very heartbreaking circumstances. And I've come to the conclusion that, that in our culture, this is one of the most dangerous, if not the most dangerous area. We need guardrails. We need guardrails. These should just be part of our our standard operating procedures. 
And some of you are going to say, oh, Pastor, well, that's, that's extreme. Uh, and some of you are going to say, well, in my environment, in my work environment, I, I can't do this. I would just invite you to start praying that this would become uh, a reality, that this would become a possibility. So I've got two lists of guardrails this morning. I've got a list for the married folks. I've got a list for the, the single folks. We're going to begin with the, the married folks. Married people, guardrails, here we go. Don't travel alone with members of the opposite sex. Just don't do that. Don't get in a car with, don't fly with, don't go on a business trip with. Uh, if you're married, just decide I will not travel alone with members of the opposite sex. And separately, number two, don't eat alone with members of the opposite sex. Every affair, affair that I've tried to help people navigate through from a pastoral care standpoint, every one of them began right here. Well, we went, we went, to, we went to lunch. We went to get coffee. Lunch turned into dinner, and dinner turned into working late. Don't eat alone with members of the opposite sex. You might say, well, that's extreme. Well, guardrails are extreme, but you will not regret it. Now, things come up. I understand that. And maybe now we kind of have understanding. You know, if, if something comes up in circumstances, you know, just make a phone call. Just call and say, hey, you know what? Something happened. I'm going to eat lunch. Just make sure that your spouse is aware if something comes up. So don't travel alone with, don't eat alone with members of the opposite sex. Number three, you're going to laugh. Don't hire cute members of the opposite sex because you want to help them. You might. Come on, you know exactly what I mean. Some of your wives have told you, I'm not comfortable with that. Some of your husbands have told you, I'm not comfortable with you working alongside that. I'm not comfortable with, with that. Yeah, but they, they really need a job. I really want to help them. Why can't you find somebody else to get a job to? <laughs> Yourself. Don't deceive yourself. Don't hire cute people just because you're trying to help them. You say, Pastor, where did you come up with that? Take a while, guess. Take a while, guess. Story after story of tearful women, tearful men coming to me and saying, I told her, I told him I was not comfortable with that. So don't hire members, cute members of the opposite sex, because you want to help them. Number four, don't confide in or counsel with. Members of the opposite sex. Just don't. I mean, this is why you don't have coffee, this is why you don't have lunch. 20 minutes turns into an hour, turns into an hour and a half. And said, Oh, I've never had anybody listen to me the way you listen to. And if you saw that in the Hallmark video, if you saw that plot, you would know exactly where it was going. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you don't go to eat. That's why you don't travel alone. And you may, that may sound not very compassionate. I, I realize that. But they need me, they, they need me to. No, they don't. The most compassionate thing that you can do for them and for your marriage, don't confide in, don't counsel with, don't confide in, don't counsel with. It's such a dangerous thing when our emotional world gets intertwined with somebody else's emotional world. You know, you've crossed an, an invisible, intangible line in regards to intimacy. And let, let's face it, that's what we all want, intimacy. And intimacy is as much as our culture wants to tell us is the opposite. Intimacy does not begin with the physical. Intimacy begins with the emotional. That's why it is so dangerous. You know, I'm a pastor. I'm a professional helper. That's what I try to do, professional helper. I have to be very careful about this guardrail because I, I can't tell you all the pastors, all the counselors that I've come across that have completely blew up their marriage trying to help someone else. The most compassionate thing you can do for your family and for their future, set some guardrails in this area. Do not confide in, do not counsel with. Number five, last one, married people. When you feel your heart or desire drifting toward a specific person, a specific person, you need to tell someone. You need to have a, a safe place. You need to have a safe person. You can say, you know, I'm, gosh, I'm so embarrassed for this, but you know what? I've been really thinking about so-and-so. I, I kind of feel my mind drifting in that direction. You need to have a safe place, a safe person to tell them to. Maybe that is your spouse, uh, but maybe 
maybe that's that conversation comes later. Man, when they're just a certain guy, you know, there's a certain girl that really gets, you know, have that conversation, have a safe person you can say, not when you've acted on it, but when you just have your heart just has the desire, you feel kind of drifting in that direction. Have a safe place, a safe person to, to tell. Maybe embarrassing. You will not regret it. You will never, ever regret it. Married folks, uh, you need to, now these are just five suggestions here. But married folks, you, you need to have a conversation uh, with your spouse about some guardrails. You need to make them specific to your relationship. Guardrails, boundaries. You will never, ever, ever regret establishing guardrails. There are so many people, so many couples that wish they could go back and rear your mirror of life and, and set some some guardrails and boundaries. All right, single people. Single people, really easy. Just gouge your eyes out of the screen. <laughs>
A year from now, you will find yourself a completely different person. I think you will, you will think about love completely different. You will think about life completely different. And you will be ready to establish a God-centered, healthy, right kind of intimacy relationship. Remember the opposite says. Take a year off. Let God cleanse your heart. <coughs> Heal your heart. Prepare you for the person that he wants you to spend the rest of your life with. Too extreme? I don't think so. I think it sounds like common sense to me. So let me tell you a secret. If you want one of those, you know, truly amazing, one of a kind, kind of, you know, just you're the only one for me marriage. You know what you need? You need intimacy. And the biggest thing that fuels intimacy in marriage is exclusivity. Exclusivity. When your spouse knows that you're the only one for her, you're the only one for him. And there's a there's an old song that says, I only have eyes for you. When your spouse knows that, because that is a powerful, powerful thing. Where does that begin? I think it begins with guardrails. It begins with boundaries, standards, to which the world will never understand. Maybe it begins with a, a year off. But don't be fooled. Our culture is so persistent in this area. Our culture is going to bait you right to the edge of disaster. Let's establish some guardrails. Let's establish some boundaries. Because if we get this one area right, I am convinced that it will completely transform our world. And so, when it comes to this particular area, what else would you expect your Heavenly Father to say? Our Heavenly Father who who is a, a good, good father. He knows what's best for you. He wants what's best for you. He would say, flee. Flee from sexual immorality. God would say, don't you know that your body is precious to me? Don't you know that in some mysterious way I live inside of you? Honor me with your body. And I will honor you with your relationships. Because God is the creator. He's the inventor of relationships. God invented sex. He did. He said it is good. If sex is a fire, God brought the, the matches. It's a good. And he is honored by it when it's used according to his purpose, which is within the safety of marriage. It was his idea. God won't be mocked by its misuse. When we learn to honor God with our bodies, I believe the reward is that God will honor us in our relationships. We're going to get there, though. If we're going to live there, we've got to start talking about boundaries. We've got to start talking about guardrails in our relationships. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. God, I pray that you would give us the, the courage to do this. Give fathers and mothers the courage to, to model this. Help our single folks. Help our college students live this out despite what's happening in our culture. Wherever we are, or wherever we spend our time, will give us the wisdom to know what to do with what we've heard, and the courage to do it. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This time, we're going to spend this a little bit of time honoring our saints that have gone before us. And so, as we read the names of, of those that have joined the church triumph in the past year, we're going to light a candle and ring a bell. And, if you're a family member of the person that we name, I invite you to stand. Rodney Edwards. Terry Benson, George Faggot, Kathy Newton,
I'll be basing them. George Jacobs. Sandy Johnson. George Beaver. James Johnson. Jeanette Shell. <laughs> Daisy Sector. Carol Moss. Fred Shipwash. Saints have gone before us. God, we're grateful for all of those that have gone before, and Lord, who have influenced us, who have loved us, who have shown your love to us. Lord, grant that they have received their reward, and Lord, that they are in your power and serve in your heavenly kingdom. Lord, give these families your peace. Lord, help us to remember, help us to mourn, but we mourn differently because we mourn the world. Lord, we thank you for these saints, and we remember them in Jesus' name. I invite you to stand here for our closing song.
Let's go forth and do that. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 